Donald Trump and the leaders of South Korea and Japan issued a joint statement today urging new sanctions on North Korea. That statement comes just days after the North tested a ballistic missile that experts say is capable of reaching Alaska. And as the Trump administration has started openly talking about the possibility of war on the Korean Peninsula. Cable news, of course, is flush with cartoon portrayals of North Korea and its leader. But what's really behind the latest bout of tensions? And how can we make peace in the two Koreas once and for all? Joining me now is Hyun Lee, managing editor of Zoom in Korea and fellow at the Korea Policy Institute. Hyun Lee, welcome to the program. Or welcome Thank you back. for having me. It's great having yes. you again. Uh, first off, I want to talk about this missile, the so-called Hwasong-14, and please correct any of my mispronunciations. How significant... That sounds correct. Okay, thank you. How significant of a threat does this actually represent to American security, and how does it threaten American interests? Yeah, I'm going to quote David Sanger of the Council on Foreign Relations. He wrote this week in the New York Times that uh, North Korea's ICBM, the Hwasong-14, is a threat to U.S. interests not because... Uh, the North Koreans will actually use it to launch a preemptive attack against the United States. So then why is a threat to U.S. interest? Uh, I think there are two reasons for that. Number one, he says, it's because now North Korea has an effective form of deterrence. So in the event the U.S. decides to take military action, North Korea actually has a, a way to strike back. Um, the Hwasong-14 can actually strike the heart of the U.S. Pacific Command uh, that is located in Hawaii. Um, and so what that means is that the United States can no longer threaten uh, North Korea with regime collapse and bully it around. Um, and that actually changes U.S. strategic calculus in the region. So for that reason, Washington is very nervous. Number two, if North Korea's missile program becomes an example for other countries to follow in the future, that actually challenges the nuclear non-proliferation regime, which, let's face it, is essentially uh, aimed at guaranteeing that only the five permanent members of the UN Security Council and nobody else can have nuclear weapons. That's the real reason why Washington thinks North Korea's ICBM is a threat to its interests. Although that hasn't worked out so well. I mean, you've got Pakistan, you've got uh, Israel, you've got uh, India. I mean, these are not permanent members of the, well, maybe they are. I, mean, I, I, I don't believe so, though. Um, right. I, I, nuclear proliferation seems like it's gone beyond just the, the UN Security Council. Yeah, um, you know, the United States accuses North Korea of violating UN resolutions and then urges the UN to punish North Korea by piling on more sanctions. But let me explain a few reasons why uh, that's a hypocrisy. Number one, there is actually no international law that says that prohibits countries from testing nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. In fact, the United States routinely tests ballistic missiles. Uh, so there is no legal basis for the UN resolution that condemns North Korea's missile and nuclear tests. And the UN Security Council, especially the five permanent members, which all have nuclear weapons, they have no legal or moral authority to decide who can and who should not have nuclear weapons. Um, the second reason uh, is that North Korea is not in violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, Article 10 of the NPT says, parties have the right to withdraw from the treaty if extraordinary circumstances jeopardize the country's supreme national interests. What happened back in 1993, after the fall of the Soviet Union, is that the United States announced that it was going to redirect its nuclear weapons that were aimed at the Soviet Union towards North Korea. And then it immediately started military exercises right at the North Korean border involving tens of thousands of U.S. troops uh, and B-1B and uh, B-52 nuclear bombers um, and, and naval vessels uh, that are equipped with cruise missiles. North Korea determined at that time this is a threat to our supreme interests, and so they gave notice to the UN we are withdrawing from the NPT, and they followed pr proper procedures as uh, outlined in the treaty uh, to withdraw from, from the NPT. Right. The United States 
on the other hand, is in violation of the NPT, which says nuclear weapon states should reduce their nuclear arsenal and move towards complete elimination. The United States right now is spending billions of dollars each year to actually modernize its nuclear arsenal. Um, so, and, and then the third point, which I think is the most important point, is that North Korea actually has a policy of no first strike, which means that it will not use its nuclear weapons preemptively for an offensive purpose. It will only use it defensively. The United States notably does not have the same policy, and its war plans in Korea actually include preemptive nuclear strikes against North Korea, uh, and they routinely rehearse this scenario. Um, and so for all of those reasons, we should know that U.S. sanctions against North Korea are not legal. Yeah. This, you know, the, 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 the typical characterization of North Korea and Kim Jong-un in the United States is that it is a, a, an out-of-control rogue nation run by a crazed dictator who routinely starves his own people, runs these little Potemkin villages that look like they're actually functional stores and businesses and things, when in fact it's all, you know, it's just this giant military, uh, bizarre uh, hero-worship cult. And, and, and therefore, uh, these crazy people should not be allowed to have nuclear weapons. I mean, that's that's a, my understanding of essentially the argument that that probably the average person on the street in the United States would make, and and they might react to the things that you're saying by saying, "Wait a minute, are you shelling for North Korea?" I mean, this this, this sounds like they're not that unreasonable. Um, how do the, how do you reconcile these two visions essentially yeah. of of this state? Yeah. Well, I think what I would say to people who characterize North Korea as being belligerent because it continues to fire off, uh, you know, ballistic missiles is uh, by asking, you know, let's just imagine that North Korea does give up its nuclear weapons. It stops its tests and says, OK, we're going to lay down our arms. What would happen next? Um, I'm pretty convinced that if North Korea had not developed nuclear weapons, that the United States would have invaded it already. Um, and I think that's the lesson that North Korea drew from watching the experiences of Iraq and Libya. Um, and so to me, I think if we are really concerned about global peace, then which I assume most of your audience members are, then I think the real question we have to ask ourselves is how do we then create the conditions in the world so that countries like North Korea, because there may be other countries in the future, so that they don't have to turn to nuclear weapons to defend their sovereignty. Yeah. And I think that's where the real conversation needs to begin. This it just sounds so rational. Um, president Moon, the brand new president of South Korea, campaigned on Basically, rapprochement. I'm not sure he ever used that word or its equivalent, but um, you know, coming up with some sort of a reasonable peace agreement with North Korea, um, uh, and and increasing communication, economic activity, uh, you know, family meeting, you know, basically normalizing their relationship to, to the extent that it's possible. Um, is that is that essentially is is his worldview? First of all, which seems to be shared by a majority of South Koreans, they just uh, you know overwhelmingly elected him. Is that essentially consistent with what you've been saying up to this point? And mm -hmm. um, and if so, you know, how does the South respond to the to the to the rhetoric that is completely contrary to that that we've been hearing from President? Trump, you know, which seems very confrontational, number one. And number two, how does South Korea intend to pursue some sort of rapprochement like that, some sort of, you know, uh, reconciliation? Uh, particularly, I mean, given that today they joined Japan in, in uh, calling for sanctions. Yes. Um, as you mentioned, Moon Jae-in was elected through mass protests that brought out millions of people week after week for five months um, that eventually led to the ouster of the previous president. So his election was really a mandate uh, by the South Korean people for systemic change, including a very different approach toward inter-Korean relations. Um, 
I think that so far, Moon Jae-in's policy pronouncements have been very confusing. Um, let me explain why. Um, you know, he came to Washington last week and signed a joint statement uh, with Trump that is all about strengthening the U.S. ROK alliance. Now he's in Europe saying South Korea will negotiate a peace treaty with North Korea. Um, these two things don't make sense. Uh, number one, um, at the end of the Korean War in 1953, the armistice, which is a temporary ceasefire that was signed, uh, that was signed between the United States and North Korea. That means those two countries are still in a state of war. So replacing that with a peace treaty also has to involve United States and North Korea as the primary parties. So unless Moon Jae-in is able to persuade Trump to take a very different approach to North Korea, whatever he's able to negotiate in terms of a peace treaty is not going to be very meaningful. Hmm. Number two, uh, the U.S. and South Korea are bound by the Mutual Defense Treaty, which says in the event of war, South Korean troops have to fight alongside the, uh, the United States. And the United States still has wartime operational control. So U.S. Uh, commanders would command South Korean troops in the event of war. So strengthening the U.S. ROK alliance is actually a very hostile policy towards North Korea. They rehearse regime collapse scenarios uh, routinely. Uh, they fly nuclear bombers uh, in the Korean, over the Korean Peninsula. They train special operations teams that are ready to take out the North Korean leadership. So Moon Jae-in has to decide, is he going to strengthen the U.S. ROK alliance or move towards reconciliation peacefully with North Korea? Right. I don't think you can have both things at once, which is what he's talking about. So I don't think that, uh, you know, as long as that policy stands, I don't think he will get very far, Sounds like a tough and dangerous time. Hyun Lee, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you.